Sergeant Bill Knizel, United States Army, Vietnam. Bill's one of my Brenham, Texas veterans that I interviewed in 2010. I about two dozen interviews down there. Actually premiered a film in 2010 called Lest They Be Forgotten, Texas, one of my uh, films in my documentary series, Lest They Be Forgotten. And Bill's one of my Texas veterans, just a great man, told a great story of Vietnam. They're all good little folks, they're all good. And I'm just so happy that I met him. It was in uh, February of 2010 in Brenham, Texas, like I said. And um, Bill and his friend Gene Kelm, Gene, like I said in my last message, um, is my favorite story of all times. And uh, Bill went into the military volunteer draft, so he was able to guide his future a little bit more than the government. So two years um, assigned, signed up for, and uh, he was 20 years old at the time. I think he'd gone to college for a couple of years. Went into the military, uh, infantry, Fort Polk, Louisiana, where his basic and advanced infantry training was at. He was trained in 81 millimeter mortars. Went to Vietnam and just really tells a great story. He was with the 199th Light Infantry C Company. And that was a part of the 4th Division and the 12th Brigade. So 4th of the 12th. And, um, like I said, he tells a great story. He became a sergeant over there and just uh, his perspective through his eyes and ears, it's just, it's just, it's very great, it's very keen. And I wanna thank Michael and Darlene Sarofsky in the Denver area. God bless you guys, love you guys. Thank you so much for stepping forward, Michael, and just making these stories possible. You're just a great man. You're one of my special people in my life. And I love you, brother. Hope to meet you and your wife soon. And you're making it possible for others to learn more about Vietnam, learn about our history. And that means a lot to me, Michael. I salute you. You're appreciated, brother. Folks, if you'd like to sponsor a story like Michael and Darlene have, there's information in the video description of all my videos on my website, LarryCapetto.com. Click on the link that says Sponsor a Vet and I'll do the rest. If you'd like to, I'd like to encourage you to donate to my work. There's information in the comment section of every one of my videos. I don't monetize, I don't sell commercials, I don't think that's appropriate, it's very disrespectful. And uh, that's, my, my, that, that's my desire, is not to do that. So I don't want to clutter up a story with a commercial, that's very disrespectful. Okay, folks, thank you for subscribing to this channel, we're over 50,000 subscribers now. Listen to Voices of History Radio as a supplement to these stories. It's a great educational tool for our students, I'm trying to get it into the hands of students. If you can help me do that, folks, if you're an educator, a principal of a school, a teacher, I would greatly appreciate hearing from you so we can get this free app into the hands of your students as they can listen to the history. They're not getting it, folks. I can't, my heart cries. They're not getting it in the textbooks. World War II now, even Korea, Vietnam especially, we're not hearing the stories. Even Iraq, 20 years ago, we were in Iraq for the first time. So the history's not there, but I've got it. Voices of History, let's get this app from the radio station in the hands of our kids. Work with me on this. If you want to take part in that, help support that. It's a great cause, folks, to get that, to do that. And then anybody else that wants to listen on the way, truck drivers, those that are commuting, housewives, anybody at home, you know, just, I listen to it all the time, mowing the yard, whatever I'm doing. I just put my headphones on and I just escape with my stories and my veterans, so. Okay, folks, that's it. I'm stopping now. Let's listen to another story here on the Voices of History. YouTube channel and radio station. Oh, my heart's full. Okay. Bill, God bless you. Thank you for telling me your story and I hope others will learn from it. Amen. Now 63. And what year did you go to Vietnam? And uh, I went there in uh, August of 67, and 1967. So you were drafted? I was drafted. And I uh, went to junior college for a couple of years, so I was 20 when I went into the service. And uh, after I got my two years in at San Jacinto Junior College there in Pasadena, then I uh, 
became eligible as a 1A. And instead of waiting for them to draft me, I went in as a volunteer draft. That way I would only spend two years in the service unless I were elected to stay longer. And I would still be able to uh, go in when I wanted to go rather than when they say, come on. Were you in the Army? Yes, I was in the Where Army. Where would you go to basic training at? at? Uh, Fort Polk, Louisiana. Artillery or? No, oh, infantry. 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 Yeah. That's where Sonny went, this gentleman I interviewed earlier. So, um, Okay, you're in 67. Right. That's and amazing. He went in 67, too. Um, what group were you with? What division or company well, were you with? Well, uh, there at Fort Polk, you just go to basic training, and then from there, you go into what they call AIT, which is Advanced Infantry Training. And it's across uh, another part of uh, Fort Polk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I think each one of them was about eight weeks. Basics eight weeks and AIT's eight weeks. And then you get your assignment as to where you're going from there. Some stayed in states, and but about 90% of us went to Vietnam. What did you know about Vietnam before that? Anything? Nothing except what we learned in the in basic. That most of the drill sergeants are uh, people that had already gone to Vietnam. And when they would come back, then they would be trainers of those that are going. And that's the way the cycle worked. Mm -hmm. And so what you learned was the war stories that they told. All right. Was boot camp so, difficult? Do you still remember it? I still remember it. And were they training you for Vietnam? I mean, you knew you were going? Was well, in basic out? training, it's uh, all uh, geared on infantry. So everybody that goes into the Army is... Uh, you have to make it through basic training, and then you can go into the infantry from there to be trained, you know, th doing everything then. And uh, I was, uh, my MOS, which is uh, what they call uh, what you're going to be in the Army, and that was, uh, I was trained in 81 millimeter mortars. And uh, so some of the other guys were trained as riflemen, and then you had the M60 machine gun. Over there you have a company, and it's built up of four platoons. The first three platoons are riflemen, and then the fourth platoon is your uh, mortar platoon. And they would stay in behind in uh, the forward base camp that you would set up, and then the other three platoons kept the perimeter safe for the mortar guys inside the perimeter and uh, the outside guys would go out on ambushes and stuff at night time and then we'd do sweeps during the day and a sweep was where you just go get on the helicopters they drop you in a zone in a grid coordinated area and then you would sweep that area and try to clear it and make sure there's no enemy in there anywhere and that's how you ended up in your firefights. Tell me about going to Vietnam, though. What you experienced when you first landed or we got over there. Tell me what you remember about that. Uh, it was just, uh, well, uh, we went on a commercial airliner, which was Pan Am at the time for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you get there, you, all you do is uh, go where they tell you to go. And uh, you end up, uh, I ended up at Long Bend in Vietnam, which was a large uh, army base. And uh, there was as many as 50,000 soldiers there. And uh, from there, that's the staging area. And uh, I can remember the first night I was there, they handed me an M16, a clip of ammo, and they sent me out into a bunker on the perimeter there at Long Bend. And they used the new guys to teach you how to stay up at night and to uh, what you was looking for. Of course, nobody ever, you know, we didn't get attacked or anything. So it was more of a training situation for us. And uh, I guess I stayed there for a couple of weeks before they finally sent me, uh, assigned me to a company and then I left from there and went out with that company. So you got into combat when? When was the first time you had combat over there? Do you remember that? Uh, I was there about three months. 
when I got into a big firefight. And that's when I got a little shrapnel here in my belly and uh, ended up about 20 days in the hospital recovering from that. And then I went back out again to the same company. So you were, it wasn't a serious one, you got to go back. Right. Yeah. What's it like being a young man in, in Vietnam? And where were you, Central Highlands or where were you? No, Long Ben is just east of Saigon. Okay. And uh, they don't, uh, send you very far you know uh, if you're based at Long Bend that's called your rear base camp and then you would go out to forward base camps where your company would actually set up a perimeter you'd fill up sandbags and build your bunkers and everything for protection and uh, then you would be picked up by the helicopters daily to go out to little areas that were close by your base camp, your forward base camp there, and that's where you would do your sweeps, as I, we talked about a few minutes ago. And that's basically what I did for a year. And uh, I was in the 199th Light Infantry, and uh, what we did when we weren't sweeping is we would go and uh, help other divisions like the 25th division that did a lot of uh, sweeps and stuff in the Chulai area it wasn't very far from where we was and we and on occasion they would have us helicopter in to help support them tell me about the, the Huey helicopters yes sir the Hueys Would they take you in the landing zones and sure just tell me about the Huey helicopter in Vietnam well, the purpose of the I, I know the answer, but just tell me for the camera. This well, I want to hear what you're what you have to say about that. Well, those they were uh, they had a pilot and a co-pilot, and then they had a M60 machine gunner on each side. They had no doors on them. Uh, you would get in them, and you would sit in there, and they'd have ten or twelve of us in there. And then when they would they wouldn't actually touch down to land, they would come within two or three feet of the ground and everybody would jump off of the helicopter and land in the, usually it was rice paddies and it was wet, unless she was in the dry season, which was much shorter than the wet season. And uh, that's, uh, you know, they were a real good support and we couldn't have done without them. Did you do a lot of combat assaults with the Hueys or just? No, uh, they drop you off, they fly away and you're there. And then they would come back and get you in uh, six, seven, eight hours whenever we got finished with our sweep for the day. And then you'd come back to the forward base camp and then you'd go out on ambush at night, which was nothing more than you going out a couple of hundred meters away from the perimeter and that way you would be first to spot anybody that was trying to come in at night and surprise you. And you said you did sweeps. Mm -hmm. How many men are you with? I mean, uh, usually it was, yeah, it would be one platoon, which would be uh, anywhere from 12 to 20. Uh, guys at a time. What was the worst encounter that you had? And we were fighting the VC or the NVA or both? The No, just the VC, mm -hmm. the Viet Cong. They were in black pajamas and carrying AK-47s and uh, RPG, which was an uh, army, uh, what do you call it? Uh, yeah. And uh, that's usually, usually they were the ones that initiated the first contact. But they're dug in and you're walking around. So when they open up on you, then you get down into the, the rice paddy there and the dikes was your protection. And then you would fight it out. We'd call in the uh, Hueys with the, with the rocket launchers on them and they would uh, support us with air support. Mm -hmm. The and gunships would come in then? Or? Sure, that's the gunships, mm -hmm. which was still a Huey helicopter. But uh, that's the way it worked. So you were there a year? 
I was there 11 months and a few days. When you first get in country, is it you're new? Maybe the older guys don't want to be around you because you're new, I mean? No, it's not that way at all. No, because they, when I went out to meet with my company, there wasn't but a half a dozen of us that was added to 120. So, you, you know, they were glad to see you. Because you're, you know, you're uh, building up their numbers, and the more the better. And you said you're with the 199? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Company C. And uh, the 4th Battalion and the 12th Infantry Brigade. <laughs> so it's a long Company C 4 slash 12. Did you lose friends that you were with? Mm-hmm. Wounded or killed? Oh, I had a very good friend that was killed. Yeah, in that same firefight that uh, I was there about three months. The one thing good about my year was is that I didn't have too many contacts. I had probably, I could count all the firefights that I went through in the year and on one hand that I can remember. And, uh, and most of them weren't uh, too bad except for the very first one. And that involved three of our companies. See, we had a company A, B, C, and D. And I was in Company C at the time, and uh, Company B. So when we got first in country and there was 100 of us, then you'd have 25 going to each of these four different companies or however it worked, you know. And so some of the guys that I trained with at Fort Polk was in a different company, but they were still in the 199th Light Infantry out of Long Bend. So when we'd come back to the... Long been on a four-day rest, which we call an R&R, &R, rest and recuperation. We would get to see those guys that we trained with at Fort Polk a, a lot of times, but not every time. And uh, I had one real good friend that was, uh, we, you know, kind of became buddies, and uh, he didn't make it out of that first firefight. I think we lost two or three in that one firefight. And I was one of the fortunate ones to get out of there. And uh, by then, I was, I was not ever assigned to the mortar platoon that I was trained to do. I became a rifleman in the first couple of months. And then as the guys that get their year in and leave, then you have an open position and you have to fill it. So I became the M60 machine gun guy. And I did that for about four months. And then I made a E5, which is a buck sergeant, they call them, after eight months. And then I became the platoon leader. Mm. And I did that in, for almost three months. And by then, it was almost time for me to come home. So tell me about being a buck, you said buck sergeant? Mm -hmm. What was that like? And what kind of men did you have? And did you lose any of them? No. Didn't lose any men. As a matter of fact, I don't recall ever getting in a firefight after I became a sergeant with any of my guys. All we did was do the ambushes. And like I said, I didn't, uh, you don't have a firefight every day. You know, they're, they're few and far between, thank goodness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, you go a long time. Now, every once in a while, we'd have one of our point men or something come up on a booby trap, a grenade or something, and he could get hurt bad. And we did have that happen that I can remember a couple of times, but not when I was a sergeant, before I became a sergeant. But just becoming a sergeant didn't keep me from getting shot at. Did you ever have to assign somebody to walk point? Or is that something you have oh, to yeah, we, Yeah, we do that. Yeah, And you would... Uh, not the same person walk point every time. You uh, rotate it. Because that's a dangerous place to be, right? Right, very dangerous. Yeah, that and being a second lieutenant. <laughs> yeah, we lost more second lieutenants than anybody I can remember. Well, why, why is that? I mean, that's an interesting thought as far as... Well, they're looking... into a combat situation and probably never having, you know... 
Well, why do you think we did lose a lot of first, second lieutenants? Well, I don't know. I, I always thought it may be their training. Mm -hmm. They're a little overzealous. And, uh, and plus, they had a lot of responsibility, you know, because they had more than just one platoon under them. Right. And uh, so, you know, you have a second lieutenant, first lieutenant, and then the captain. So, they, you know, they were, they were gung-ho. And uh, sometimes that's not as good as being a little fearful. You know, sometimes fear can save you. I'm, I'm not a big fan of movies per se as far as war, but I think of Forrest Gump of all movies, that scene where they're out in the field. Did you ever see that movie? Mm-hmm. Was that, a, did that depict at all maybe a little bit of the life of a grunt or a soldier? in Vietnam, the field scenes, the artillery, the, the, you know, they came under fire. I mean, did that at all remind you of Vietnam? Uh, yes, it did. How about We Were Soldiers? Did you watch that movie? No, I hadn't seen that. As a matter of fact, I, I, I try to shy away from those Vietnam movies. That's fine. That's, I, I would encourage you to shy away from them. <laughs> Just listen to you talk. Sometimes my mind's grasping for something visual that I can... Mm -hmm. that I can relate to without having ever been there. But uh, um, I realized there wasn't f shooting every day, you know, but you had to be prepared for that. Right. So. I think the, the, the stress that you're under is, is more so with all of the lack time that you have where you're not uh, engaging anybody. Right. And uh, that's where the stress builds up. It's because you, you don't, you know, the unknown is the worst part about it. It's, it, your training takes over once you engage the enemy, and that seems to be the, you know, finally <laughs> type thing going on. But uh, it's not a fun time, believe me. So there was, uh, you, you mentioned the unknown, so I'm assuming there was a, de a degree of uncertainty that kept things, you know, or even like today in Iraq or whatever, there's that uncertainty. Right. Now. Well, when you're going through the villages and you've got all of these Vietnamese people there, the mothers, the dads, all the kids that are in the villages, and these, these houses are grass houses. You know, they're built from what we call over here palmetto leaves is what it looks like. And, uh, you know, their water is from a barrel where the water from the rain runs off of the roof and they catch it in a barrel and that's what they drink. You know, that's their good water. And uh, they set up these little dams along in the uh, rice paddies between on the dikes and they catch all the snakes and stuff that when they let the water out of one and run it into another one that's a little lower, then that's how they catch their food. It's, uh, it's quite an experience to see how the primitive people live. And uh, when you're walking through those villages, you can't tell uh, a Viet Cong enemy from a Papa son or a, or a young man there that's uh, one of the sons. You, you don't know what you're into mm -hmm. and, until they finally decide that they're going to fight back with you. And so it's a, it's quite an experience to do that. So when you came home, tell me about your last day in Vietnam and then coming home and what type of homecoming you received. Well, the way I left Vietnam was by myself because a Red Cross called for me. Uh, my dad had a, a serious operation and so the Red... And, the doctors got a hold of the Red Cross and they uh, said that he would probably be much better if I was here. So they uh, sent for me. So I had 20 days left to go in country before I was eligible to come home. So I got to leave 20 days early. So I didn't have to, to go through the stress time at the end that you do, oh gosh, am I going to make it? You know, it, it just happened all of a sudden. I didn't even know it was coming. So I flew home by myself. When I got home, I got off the plane. I uh, can't even remember who there met me and uh, brought me home. But anyhow, I went to the hospital from there. 
So my departure was much different than most of them. Yeah. And all of my pictures and my clothes, everything was left behind because I didn't have time to procure any of that. Mm. And I was much happier leaving than I was trying to grab stuff. So that's the way that worked out. You never missed it, did you, after you got away? That's a silly question. <laughs> I mean. No, I didn't miss it, but I thought about it a lot. And finally, as the, the years went by, the memories are harder to bring back up. Harder to remember, just harder. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, as we get older. Mm -hmm. And it's is been there, a long time now. Yeah. Is there a lesson learned from Vietnam for our country? I mean, what do you think we've learned? <laughs> or have we? Well, I don't think we have. But, uh, this, you know, everybody talks a lot about the support and everything or the lack of support. And I really didn't feel that at all. It was, uh, I guess I grew up, you know, loving my country. So it was just something that I did that I wanted to do. And uh, when I came back home, I went back to normal life. And it was all behind me, and uh, I don't, I don't know what kind of a guy I would be today if I hadn't have been there. Mm -hmm. I mean, how can you? You only get to go through this life once, so you don't get to try it another time and go a different way. But I did become a police officer, which was still in the same line of work, uh, serve and protect. So. And I did that for 30 years. So my, 30 years, wow. So my life's work has been carrying a gun. Where did you work? At H, uh, Houston Police Department. No kidding. Mm -hmm. I did that for 20 years, and then I retired from there and went to Harris County for 10 years. Because back when I was a policeman, you could actually retire at 20 years and start drawing a pension. So that's what I did. And uh, I was able to take my pension money and send my kids to college and uh, still work in police work at Harris County. And I was there a couple of years when I made sergeant there and I worked in the jail for 10 years at the county level. I've met several prior law enforcement that have worked in law enforcement in the area and um, I'm working on a fi another film about those that have served in law enforcement too. So maybe if I come back, we'll talk about that too. I have to make a note of that. That's great. You know Larry Joe Powell? Oh yeah. yeah. I didn't know he'd been in law enforcement over 30 years and mm -hmm. talked to him last time, so that's great. Is that Larry or Freddie? Freddie Joe Pollen? Is that Powell. who? Larry oh, Joe Powell. Powell. Yeah. No, no, okay, I was, I'm thinking of a different okay. person. That's okay. Was he with HPD? I, no, no, he oh. worked around here. Oh. Yeah. No, I'm not from around here. Yeah. Um, I caught the headlines yesterday of the Houston paper. The off-duty officer was shot. Did you hear that? Mm -mm. Yeah. Okay. Well, no, I haven't heard it yet. Um, anyways, Vietnam, you come home and you don't talk about it for years, or did you talk about it? No, I don't talk about it. I mean, when you first came home, you didn't talk about it? No. Why, why is it referred to as an unpopular war? Where does that come from? Well, there was so much, uh, I mean, when I was over there, it wasn't unpopular to me. It, and we didn't know a whole lot about what was going on back here in the States. But, uh, you know, I, I probably learned more about the unpopular war since I've gotten older. <laughs> and, you know, people like yourself asking us about it. But, uh, like I said, I don't uh, see it as anything other than it was just my turn mm -hmm. and uh, I did it and I lived through it and thank God. What does freedom mean to you Bill? Tell me about freedom. What does that mean to you? Well the ability to do whatever you want to do and uh, that's the one thing we have in this country that you don't have everywhere. Freedom is very important. 
and uh, something that we should all cherish. Have you ever seen the Vietnam Wall? No. Do you ever desire to do that someday? Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I've just never been at the right place at the right time to see it. As a matter of fact, I looked it up on the internet this morning, yeah. trying to see if if there's somewhere that lists all of the 55,000 people that are on it. I haven't been able to find one yet. But you haven't been to D.C. and seen no. the memorial there? No, I haven't. It's amazing. Um, how about the flag? What does the American flag mean to you as a veteran? Well, that's the... <laughs> to me, it means uh, uh, the freedom and the liberty that we enjoy, and it's very sacred to me. Are you proud that you're a Vietnam veteran? Yes. I don't, uh, I, my wife and I was talking about it earlier, and I said, you know, I'm going to this interview, and I don't even uh, know why, or I don't, I don't feel special. I just feel like everybody else. That's okay, right? I mean, to me, you're special. I mean, I see you differently than you probably see yourself, but I mean, you, the veterans that I work with, I mean, you guys are all heroes to me, and you probably will say no, but, and I've never had one of you guys tell me you're a hero, which is interesting, but, um, <laughs> just the fact that you see, you said there was a timing. You went to, you went, you did it, and you came home. Right. Simple as that. I mean, you did it's, it. Many people today serving our country, and you know, some of them feel insignificant, but I see it as a team effort, and and everybody doing their part, man. Mm -hmm. And you've done your part. So, how about people thanking you over the years? Have people thanked you for serving in Vietnam? Oh yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How about any bitterness towards the war? Or, you, you know, you seem a little unique in that you you don't have that. But has there been any bitterness towards Vietnam? Or Not like one ounce. Matter of fact, uh, the neighborhood that I lived in, where my kids grew up, the there were Vietnamese that lived just two two doors down from us. You know, and. Uh, kind of special. Mm -hmm. Did you befriend them or was it? Oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, they were very good friends. He was actually killed in his front yard. Yeah. He was a, what they call a South Vietnamese sympathizer. Yeah. And he was the editor of the South Vietnamese newspaper. And uh, I was a policeman at the time. And uh, he was killed at uh, 3.20 in the afternoon, and I worked until 3 o'clock. And when I got off around 3, I was driving home, and as I was passing by his house, which is only two houses from mine, a unit was already there, and he was laying in the front yard, and he had been machine gunned down just a few minutes before I came around the corner. And, uh, My goodness. Yeah, he was uh, assassinated. Was he? Oh, man. Mm -hmm. And he was talking to his wife on the telephone. She worked at the 7-Eleven around the, on the corner. And he was talking to her. And the guys that shot him pulled up into the driveway. And he was, uh, the uh, kitchen area was right behind the garage as the layout of the house was, and he was able to see through the garage door when the car pulled into the driveway, and he said, I need to get off the phone. Somebody's here to see me. And she says, well, uh, what's going on? And he said, well, I'm, there's somebody here. I need to go. And so he just, she said, well, just I'll stay on the line, and you tell me who it is. So he opened up the garage door and walked out front and she could hear the shooting over the phone. <laughs> so it was quite a deal. And uh, they never did find out who did it. We know who did it, but they, uh, Hobby Airport's not very far from where 
our neighborhood was, and they left there and got on a plane and went back to California. And uh, they were just uh, regular hit men. And uh, so his son was like two or three years old at the time. And so I got to watch him grow up. And sadly enough, once his son got grown, he got in with the wrong crowd of Vietnamese uh, young men, and they ended up robbing a bank downtown Houston, and he got uh, cornered by the police officers in one of the uh, parking garages there close to the bank, and he committed suicide rather than be arrested. So... Well, sometime I'd like to sit down with you and talk to you about your law enforcement career. You make a note of that. I will. I'd like to do that. But just in closing this interview, I mean, do you think it's important that we remember these stories? I mean, for future generations, World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, do you think it's important that we document and record these stories? I do. I think we can learn a lot from the wars that we've been involved in. And the way you do it is by talking to the ones that had to fight it. I agree with that, man. One more question. Um, what should our country remember about Vietnam? Hmm. That's a good question. Uh, I guess the, uh, the main thing that we can remember is that Freedom costs lives, and uh, there has to be somebody willing to fight for our freedom in order to keep us free. And that's bottom line. At the end of my interviews, I ask the veterans to salute into the camera. I, if you saw the one of my films, you'd see why. Would you feel comfortable if I asked you from where you're seated doing that for me? Uh, do you want me to stay seated and do it? Because, because of the camera. Okay. Because yeah, yeah. we normally seated, don't salute you when you're sitting seated. down. I, I do understand that. Okay. Um, I would I'd appreciate that if you would. Just give me a second here, Bill. Just All look right. right into the camera, sir. Go ahead. All right. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you.